Touchdown Florida State. Hey, Seminole fans, it's time for another edition of the Osceola Podcast. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Osceola Podcast. My name is Pat Burnham. I'm a writer for the Osceola, and I'm joined today by the owner and publisher of the Osceola, Jerry Cutts, the editor of the Osceola, Bob Ferrante, and Osceola's own football analyst, Mark Salva, who played offensive line at FSU from 1984 through 1987. It was a GA at Florida State from 19, uh, 1988 to 1993, and an uh, offensive line coach at South Carolina from 1994 to 1998. Welcome, guys. Glad to be here. Hey, how are you? Doing well, thanks. Well, guys, let's jump right into it. FSU went up to Death Valley in Clemson, South Carolina as a 26-point underdog, and it was a game they've had circled on their calendar since last season, and Clemson dominated from start to finish with a 45-14 to victory over Florida State. Uh, let's kind of get everyone's uh, quick thoughts on the game in general, and I'll start with you, Mark. Well, I was a little obviously disappointed in how he came out right after that get-go. I said earlier last week I, there were there was a couple things I wanted to see right out of the bat, right out of the gate, and you know the first couple of series, and that was on defense can we stop the run, and on offense could we handle pressure, and on both those things we didn't handle that real well coming out of the gate, and even though they came out and ran a couple trick plays, I was still like okay you know you weather this storm they they've announced their intent that they're coming after us. How are we going to respond? How are we going to respond with this crowd and this atmosphere? And, you know, are we going to stand up to it? And you know what? We, we held them on the goal line on fourth down and they ended up scoring again. Um, but after that, an offense goes out, that doesn't do much. You know, the first time we throw the ball, there's a, they, they bring a simple five man blitz. We block seven and, we have three guys blocking air, and one guy runs free and hits the quarterback, and that's bad throw. We go three and out. So the, right off the bat, I'm thinking uh, this is not a good sign. And th- I think the thing that was most disappointing, I don't think that we quit, but I, I don't think we were in a place ready to compete at this level. And that's probably the most disappointing thing to me, you know, having been a part of a program – that compete at the most elite level for such an extended period of time to now we're at a place where, you know, they scored every, just about every series except one and pull the first team out with 10 minutes to go in the third quarter when the game was 45 to nothing, you know, that to me just screams a golfing class. And, and I think the t- most telling thing to me was Dabo screaming at the kicker. And, and, and to me, what did that say? I know a lot of people were like, well, that's classless. You know, why is he dressing down this kid, in, you know, in, in front of 80,000 people on national TV? I'll tell you why he did it. And he said it at halftime. He, he, he's, you know, when I asked him about it, he gathered himself. He said he wasn't ready. He, in other words, he was on the sideline, yucking it up. We're, you know, we're, we're, we're running this team into the ground. Oh, my gosh, I got to go kick a ball. You know, a chip shot field goal, and he missed it. The kid wasn't ready. He wasn't yelling at him because he missed the kick. He yelled at him because he was he didn't have his head in the game, and that tells me that there's a standard there, that that you know everybody is at peak performance, ready to go. And when your number is called, you're expected to perform. We put you in that position. There's an expectation, and that kid fell short of that expectation. He was holding him accountable. And, and, and yes, it was a very public, but it also sent a message to the rest of the team. Even though they were having our way with us. We are going to keep our foot on the gas, and we're going to see this through, and we have a standard we got to play to, even though they won't play to it. And that, to me, was what that said. And that, to me, is, is sad on our part, you know, and excellent on their part. Bob, and so, I'll throw it to you. You know, I think Florida State wasn't competitive from the start, and that's the biggest disappointment, that the gap is still wide, and it's been a five-year losing streak now. And, and so the question moving forward maybe isn't how big that gap is with Clemson, but let's see how Florida State bounces back. What kind of character do these kids have? Is there a leadership? It seems like there might be from what Coach Taggart is telling us. And and really the big question is, can you regroup to knock off a rival that's left on your schedule, Miami or Florida? Can you get to a bowl game? Six, seven, maybe even eight wins. And, and if they can do that, they're they're taking a step forward even if they're way behind Clemson. 
Jerry? Yeah, if I could add to what Bob just said, I'd like to add on to what Bob said. Yeah. And Mark, you remember this when you were here, out here in '84. We weren't, we weren't what we became. Um, that was a slow process. Um, I agree. And, and uh, you know, even in '87, when we started the dynasty run, which you were a huge part of, we didn't win the national championship. It still took us six years after that '87 season to get where where uh, Clemson is, where Alabama is. So it's a tough process. You don't just wish it to happen and it happens. I mean, it took Dabo years to develop what he's become. So my question is, and I, I think it's a tough question, is, is this staff capable of getting there? Um, and to Bob's point, you know, it starts this week against Wake Forest. How do you get these kids ready to play? Because your first step is to get to a bowl game again. And and this is the frustration I have with expectations is our fans, I think, and me, I fight against it. We all do. It just doesn't come easy. I mean, Mark, what made the dynasty era so great, you just don't wish it and it happens. Right, I agree, and, uh, 100%. 100%. 100%. Agree. But, but see, here's the and thing. It, Go ahead. Well, and the thing is, you, started, you, you, you pointed out what it requires. It requires coaches who set an expectation for performance um, that, you, that the players achieve it, and that if they don't, the consequences are severe. Getting screamed at in front of 80,000 people is one of those ways, um, you know, gassers, um, you know, you've got to set an expectation that, that, and, and consequences to get there, to, to close that gap. But my question is, and it's the question a lot of our fans have, and it's a fair question. Do we have coaches on the staff that understand what those expectations are? And, and standards and how to get there. That's and, a big and question. The, because cause here's the thing. It's a very big question. It is. And here's the thing. You know, six games into a second year of this regime. And, again, we're not at practice. You're, you and I are not at practice. So we don't know what they're doing in practice. But the product on the field is a definite reflection on your preparation and your habits that you've, you, you've done over the course of the, the weeks of the season for each team. And when you continually see the same mistakes be made over and over, that draws that into question. We have yet to yes. we do not handle well, pressure. We do not block with great effort. Receivers are DBs playing the ball in the air. You know, these things rear their ugly head consistently. So what does that say? We hope you've enjoyed the first segment of this podcast. To hear the entire episode, as well as past and future podcasts and daily coverage of seminal sports, please subscribe to The Osceola at theosceola.com. Sign up today and enjoy a free one-week trial subscription. Try us. You can rely on us.